So today's lecture is marketing communications uh, in the principles of marketing course. And uh, it's a funny sort of lecture because uh, as we talked about in the beginning of the course, many people regard marketing as basically just uh, advertising and promotion and so forth. And so this course, which comes in as number seven in the in the course, or this class, which comes in in number seven in the in the course, uh, would be ordinarily regarded as the most important part of marketing. And we are doing it much later, and we're doing it only in one lecture. Now, of course, marketing has many parts, and they're integrated. Marketing communications is part of many things, but insofar as it is a specific uh, area within marketing, it's actually quite uh, constrained. As we've learned, product development, pricing, uh, and we'll see later, uh, partnerships and channels and distribution will are all extremely important in marketing, uh, which really defines a wide variety of business processes and goals. So this is a pretty focused interview on marketing communications. Uh, obviously, it is very important, but it is not all of marketing. So what have we done so far? We've done understanding the market. Uh, and now we're, uh, last week we did value propositions and pricing. And now we will be doing marketing communications. During the holiday weekend, we skipped a, a case study, which I will record separately and upload for the class to, to review and study. So I want to go over a few things regarding the, so we will give a quick review from the last lecture, the previous lecture, which was on value propositions and pricing. So, we have an overview of pricing. We'll talk about value propositions and pricing strategies and tactics. Again, this is a review, so I will go through this very quickly. <clears throat> so as Warren Buffett has been famously quoted, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Apart from being exchange value, so there's a relationship between value and price, price is also a signal. And we gave the example of uh, the buying the car, not just as a <clears throat> value of transportation, but also a signal of status and power and so forth. So you have uh, this uh, North Korean leader and you have all these troops sending a signal uh, of power or aggressiveness or whatever, but the car the Mercedes-Benz in this case is doing that same thing. So we review different ways of pricing. How do we set the price of uh, a product? Uh, it sounds on the surface to be fairly simple, but it's actually quite complex. And there are several different pricing approaches. We have the simplest one being a cost-based. Then we, based on the cost of the product, <clears throat> the next one being competition-based. In other words, based on what the other companies are doing. The third one is customer-based. So trying to really understand what would the customer pay. Uh, and then the fourth one, which is not necessarily exclusive, but uh, can incorporate some of the previous approaches. But the fourth one is strategy-based. And if we compare them, they have their various positives and negatives, pros and cons. So the cost base in which you basically take a product <clears throat> or service and add a certain amount to it based on the cost, that's easy to calculate, usually. Sometimes the cost can be complex, but in general, it's easy to calculate. The negatives uh, the negatives to the... Uh, uh, cost base are it doesn't leverage any uh, knowledge about the customer, uh, about the competitors, and uh, most likely doesn't maximize the profit. 
The competition based uh, is also fairly easy to estimate in most uh, markets where you just see what the price of the competitors are. Uh, it gets more competitive prices and may not also, on the other hand, maximize profit because it doesn't leverage information about the customer. And then finally, the value based, where we bring the price as close as possible to the value, what the customer really gets. Uh, so for example, somebody buying a Mercedes is buying that not just for the transport, but also for the signaling uh, of uh, status, wealth and power and so forth. So that's what the value is to that customer. And so because it has that value, the price is higher and has to be higher. <clears throat> so this can be a way of maximizing profit, but the negative of the value-based approach or customer-based approach is it can be complex because you actually have to, to really understand the customer. And then there's the uh, strategy-based approach. So as you said, the value proposition, what is a value proposition? It is the benefits to the customer minus the costs, including economic costs. Uh, this is a long discussion, so we're just doing this as a summary. The value proposition can be considered to be the intersection of three concepts. One is uh, the benefits and costs of your offering, your product. Uh, the benefits and costs of the marketplace offerings, in other words, competitors or similar products, and what the customer actually needs. And that intersection of all three is your company's particular value proposition. You obviously want to maximize that as much as possible. You can maximize that by increasing the capabilities and functions uh, and strength of your offering. So that's the product side of uh, marketing. You can increase that by getting closer to what your customer needs. And that's why market analysis is so important. And you can make that bigger by differentiating from the other competitors and uh, that's related to the marketing strategy and the differentiation that we talked about. So that's your value proposition. So in the lecture, I had highlighted this important question, uh, which we're not going to answer in this review session, but what is your personal value proposition? I think this is an extremely important question to, to ask yourselves. Um, namely, as a member of society, uh, now you are students, uh, and uh, of course you're contributing, uh, but as you move in your careers, you'll be contributing to society even more. And so it's a very important to think about this uh, concept. What is your personal value proposition? Um, what is your unique offering? How does that relate to people around you and what they need? And how does that relate to your other uh, peers and students and other people? Not necessarily in competitive way, uh, but to the extent that uh, you may want to have a unique value proposition. Uh, so in businesses and your jobs, so as you join companies or build companies will be to answer a lot of strategy questions and value propositions and plans and et cetera for these companies, which is great and that's the job. But uh, I think it's also very important for you to do your own personal thinking about this, about your value proposition, about your strategy. And of course, there's a method to why I say this, because if you're spending time thinking about your personal value proposition, and it's a very personal question, uh, that exercise not only benefits you uh, as you have a better idea of what you will uh, help in the future, but that exercise will be a good practice for when you're doing the same question for your business, your startup, etc. 
So take a moment, maybe this weekend, uh, if you haven't already, to think about this question. What is your personal value proposition? So in our review, we also talked about innovation and value and innovation being the only true way to create value. <clears throat> Uh, essentially value, if we look at it from a uh, economic standpoint, uh, in terms of profit generated and increased value, increased wealth, results from companies that are in the market, but that market is away from equilibrium. Uh, in economics, the law of supply and demand, to make a, a long argument very short, essentially results in equilibrium point, and that equilibrium point microeconomically results in uh, minimal to zero profit. Uh, so this is zero to minimal profit means that if a market is at equilibrium, then uh, a lot of value actually is not generated. So for companies to create a distinct value, they have to Defy markets, that market, they have to be move away from equilibrium. Then there are two ways to do that. Uh, one way is through rent seeking, which is monopolies, uh, patent protection, oligopoly, uh, government regulation, uh, other sorts of barriers that prevent the equilibrium. And the second way to create this value or this equilibrium is through innovation. So we have different types of innovation. Uh, and so if we really wanna generate value, which is the topic of that uh, lecture, of this review, uh, innovation plays an important role. There are different types of innovation. We won't go into that now. Now pricing strategies uh, drive pricing tactics. We have different pricing strategies. We talked about uh, penetration pricing strategy uh, where the tactic would be to keep the price low until it's established in the market. Price skimming, which was the opposite tactic, is to have a high price and then lower gradually over time. Promotional pricing, which would be low for a short period of time, then back to normal. Destroyer pricing, keep low to eliminate competitors and then raise. And demand-oriented pricing to change the price according to demand, surge pricing. So that's a review, and now we'll talk about marketing communications. <clears throat> okay, marketing communications. So we will talk about what is marketing communication, uh, sometimes abbreviated to MARCOM, the objectives of marketing communications, positioning, and execution. So as I said earlier in the introduction, the, this uh, lecture, Marketing Communications, is the promotion side of the four Ps, the marketing mix. So the four Ps are product, price, place, <laughs> and promotion. And this uh, promotion involves advertising, sales force, publicity, sales promotion, etc. So this is what we'll focus on today. Marketing communications, MarCom, is defined as all the messages and media deployed to communicate with the market, in particular, but not limited to how products and services are promoted. So promotion uh, is a major part of marketing communications, but marketing communications is a little bit broader. It includes things like branding, public relations, crisis management. Uh, during COVID-19, how the company is communicating with its customers and also its employees uh, is uh, a part of marketing communications. And indeed, we have uh, marketing communications is internal marketing related to the company. How do we motivate the employees? How do we align the employees to the strategy? How do we inform the employees? That's a form of marketing, even though it's not about the product outside. And then, of course, uh, marketing communications to the outside. So it is the message your organization is going to convey to the market. So marketing communications is quite broad. We can go through this. It's advertising, direct marketing, branding, as I mentioned, the packaging 
is a very important component of marketing communications. It's not just a television ad or a YouTube ad. Packaging plays an important role. How it looks, how the product looks, how the uh, uh, store looks. Uh, so Apple stores have a certain look. Steve Jobs had a specific role in presenting that image, and that was part of marketing communications. Uh, we often think of Steve Jobs as a technology uh, genius, but actually he was a marketing genius, and it was actually Steve Wozniak who designed the first couple of Apple computers who was really the technology person there. So Steve Jobs uh, was really about marketing communications. Uh, the online presence, including, of course, social networking, printed materials, public relations activities, sales presentations, sponsorships, such as uh, uh, athletic sponsorships, trade show appearances, and more. So let's talk about what marketing communications is not. So marketing has branding, public relations, and marketing communications is the uh, aspect of branding, the aspect of public relations that relates to communications. We will have a whole uh, lecture on branding as well. So there's an overlap with marketing communications, but branding is also uh, its own topic and of course intersects with uh, uh, the product it intersects with where the product is placed the product placement the distribution you may do co-branding you may be uh, white label branding uh, branding on, a, on a, another name there could be different brands for different channels so branding is a little more complex than just the communications but it certainly overlaps So what are the objectives of marketing communications? So you want to create, sustain demand and preference for the product. You want to position your product and you want to establish the presence preference by building a brand that will impact the market share profitability and other things such as access to talent, providing long-term value for the company. So those are the three objectives of marketing communications. Create, sustain the demand, position the product, and build the brand. So I want to do a video, and let's see if we can uh, do this. One second. Okay. So this is a uh, video of the Apple 1984 Super Bowl commercial introducing the Macintosh computer. So let me give a little bit of background. The Super Bowl, many of you may know, some of you may not, is the American championship for American football. And it has a long tradition. In fact, the tradition started with this commercial, roughly speaking, a long tradition of having commercials uh, on that show because it is the most watched uh, sports show, sports game in the United States. And so the commercials, the advertisements are very expensive. Uh, and they put a lot of effort and it's kind of almost like a Oscars for the advertising industry. In addition to, of course, serving the function of reaching the market, reaching many potential customers and consumers. So marketing firms, marketing communication, advertising firms put a lot of effort into these commercials. And so there are two winners to the Super Bowl. There is the football team that wins the Super Bowl. And there's also an informal competition of commercials, which commercial was the best one. And so that's kind of who won the Super Bowl. If someone asks 
who won the Super Bowl, you have to ask, what do you mean? Do you mean the game or do you mean the commercials? So that tradition of very competitive marketing communications uh, was almost started by this 1984 commercial by Apple. It was uh, quite, uh, I wouldn't say shocking, but it was uh, an amazing uh, commercial that completely shifted uh, not just the, the, the brand Apple computer in the market and helped drive a lot of sales of the Macintosh computer, but even shifted the whole nation, notion of how marketing communications in a commercial should work. So watch this carefully. see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Okay, so uh, that was a little bit of a strange commercial. The other piece of background that you should be aware of is the book by George Orwell, which is very famous in, in the Western world, in the English speaking world, the book 1984, some of you may have heard about it, about uh, a dystopian world where everything is uh, controlled, everything is the same, people's brains are controlled by uh, computers, by a central uh, leader, uh, that was the theme in that uh, commercial. You can see all those people almost like in prison, black and white. And uh, then this woman comes in color and smashes that. And that is to show that the Apple computer is going to break through and be something special that will liberate people and go against this very corporate, regimented conformity. Now, of course, they were talking about the IBM computer, which was the competitor. That they, uh, the IBM PC, which was the leading PC, was creating this 1984-like dystopia. And the Apple Macintosh would free up people to be more independent and more, uh, 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 free to do their individual expression and so forth. So this was an amazing commercial because uh, it uh, uh, positioned difference. We talked about marketing strategy. How are you different from the competition? It did branding, how to position the product in the mind of the customer, helping to establish and sustain that uh, brand in the mind of the customer. So it was a very uh, powerful uh, commercial that, of course, not just established the Apple brand and that product, but also uh, even the concept of the Super Bowl being a competition of advertising companies for which will be the most impactful uh, commercial. So the key element of marketing communications is to position your product. And so the, the reason I show you that commercial is the Apple Macintosh was positioned and people still remember this today. Apple still has this brand today, positioned as different from 
the corporate uh, conformity, everybody has the same big box computer, PC, et cetera. That was the positioning. And that sounds all very obvious. And this is why marketing communications can be very difficult. And in some respects, you need genius like Steve Jobs or, or so forth to express that. Because even though that positioning may be obvious, well, they may not be obvious, but that's, it's not so easy. But let's say it looks well, you know, obvious. Then how do you communicate that effectively in 30 seconds, in one minute at the most? 45 seconds. How do you communicate that? And that's another reason why this commercial was very powerful because it communicated that in a way that people could really understand that was related to their experience. The book 1984, some of you may not be familiar with, uh, but, uh, because we come from a very broad background, but 1984 was almost required reading in most American high schools. So uh, many of people, especially those who had high school education and so forth, so they might be in a position to buy a computer, 1984, uh, would have read 1984. And that was a 1984 commercial, so everybody was talking about it. It was very current. Even people who did not read the book were becoming aware of the book and its implications. So that was positioning to communication, communicating that position. So Let's break down how we can do that position to communication. Uh, there are four questions to ask about the product. Uh, what it is, and so that's the product itself. What is it? Um, what it does, what is the benefit? What it means, the effect? And why should I care, the motivation? What's interesting is these four different questions, we break them out, but in reality, uh, the message is often integrating those. So if you look at that 1984 Macintosh commercial, you can see that the benefit being free, the effect is not to be uh, <clears throat> uh, trapped in the 1984 um, uh, mentality. The motivation is I wanna be a free person. All of that comes together. And at the very end, they talk about the Macintosh computer, the product. So these four questions are separate, but the, the best marketing promotion actually uh, incorporates all of them. So as part of marketing communication, it's very important to understand the buying process. How do people actually make these decisions? And you wanna recognize a problem. You want to, uh, the person recognizes a problem the customer, they need a computer, they need to have a new car, they need to you know, have a new uh, suit or whatever. So recognition of the problem. Then they're searching for information about that, evaluating the alternatives, making a purchasing decision, and then evaluating things in a post-purchase evaluation. So marketing communications should address all of these things. You should think about ways that you communicate that your problem uh, that your uh, product solves certain problems so that when people are recognizing the problem and uh, searching about that, they will find your product. Another aspect of marketing communication is people may not recognize that they have a problem is to create the awareness of that recognition of the problem. So uh, Steve Jobs has famously said that he makes products that people did not even imagine that they need it. And so that marketing communication goes to the very beginning to recognize that there is a need or a problem. And of course, to then do marketing communications that shows that your product, your service fits that problem. Then of course, this is the very important aspect of evaluating alternatives. So you need to show how your product is distinct and better than those alternatives. And then related to the purchase decision, how do you communicate that purchase decision very easily and marketing communications around post-purchase evaluation. So let's talk about positioning. That uh, commercial positioned Apple's Macintosh as being freer 
and not constrained by conformity than the IBM product. Although you notice that in the commercial, they don't mention IBM, uh, that is by implication. So positioning creates an image of your company's product in the mind of your target customer. It deploys a set of tools and processes used to influence and control the market's perception of your product or company and in particular in relation to any competing alternatives. So if you see that commercial, you'll see that it establishes this positioning, uh, establish the perception of the product, it establishes it in relation to the competitor uh, brilliantly without even naming the competitor. That's a very powerful marketing communications of positioning. So positioning is central to marketing communications. So basketball, as you know, positioning is a single great, is very important, where you position yourself relative to the basket, your opponent, et cetera, uh, thinking about basketball. So positioning is the single greatest influence on a customer's buying decision. So another reason why that was a brilliant commercial, it's, it was the main message was about positioning. And what's interesting is that the, the positioning if you look at the time of the commercial and you analyze it from a kind of an artistic perspective, most of the positioning was by describing the, the other position, the screen with the very threatening leader, all the black and white people standing there looking like prisoners and he's talking all the time about blah, blah, blah. And that was the positioning of the alternative and, and creating that uh, fear and sort of uh, uh, terror at this situation. And the woman with the hammer only says one thing. She goes, ah, as she throws the hammer to express that effort. Only one, not even a word. So most people say positioning is, I need to talk about my product. I need to blah, blah, blah and maybe a little bit of the competitor to the end. This commercial, the Macintosh commercial, 1984, did almost the opposite. It talked, it positioned the opposition for most of the commercial, and then at a very crucial moment, positioned the Macintosh. So it's all in the mind, positioning exists in the customer's mind. So if you look at that commercial and study that commercial, you'll see that they create the mind of this 1984 dystopia, terrible situation, and create that image and then break that image of that dystopia. And what is gonna break that image? What is gonna break that future? It will be the, it will be the uh, Apple Macintosh. So that's the positioning. We want to go from the position to the uh, message, as we said. What is the product for? We want to identify your target customer. So people who like to be uh, conformist, who like to be company people, who don't want to be different, maybe that's not the target for the Macintosh. So they, they don't necessarily want to sell to everybody. Uh, but they want to sell enough to a very key market that will make a very good business. So they're choosing people and they believe most people will want to, will not want to be robots in a uh, controlling society. Some people may want to be robots in a controlling society, but Apple is saying we are positioning our product for a target market or customer that is more free thinking. You want to identify who have a compelling reason to buy. Products is, you have to explain what it is. It provides a certain benefit. It is unlike the alternative and our product is key difference or differentiation. This is a very list oriented position to message. And that's all very important. But uh, you know, if you have a commercial that says, you know, you, we, we are reaching for uh, free thinking people and those free thinking people should have enough money to buy a computer. 
Uh, our product is a you know really uh, good, easy to use computer. Uh, it helps you to write documents and uh, do spreadsheets. It's not like that IBM computer, which is very conformist, and uh, our product is uh, unique. So if you go through a list like that, of course you're satisfying this list, but that's not very effective messaging. So the messaging must include these components, but it should be much more uh, subtle than that. And that's another reason why that commercial is a good example is that it actually touches upon these positioning points without explicitly listing them. So marketing communications is very iterative. It's a very uh, uh, feedback oriented process. So the media targets the audience. The audience is looking for evidence. Evidence is constructed through your message. You make your message. It has to be in the appropriate media. That media goes to the audience. Audience is looking for evidence again, giving feedback. You modify the message. You might modify the medium. You may go on social networking and find that that's not uh, getting the right customers or it's the right uh, environment. So then you say, I'll do a Super Bowl ad on television. That might be better. Uh, or you say, well, I'll just do uh, email, direct mail, and so forth. So different messages, different mediums. Uh, maybe it's a, the wrong audience. Uh, so maybe it's the, the wrong uh, fact points, etc. So all this needs to be uh, continually uh, revised in feedback. So in your marketing plan, you have an element of evaluation and control, and that evaluation control embodies this sort of feedback. So how do we decide you know, to change the message? How do we decide to change the medium and so forth? What are the factors that are involved in that feedback? Well, those factors, the message is driven by the customer value. So one reason why we did the lecture on value propositions and pricing, and then we had another lecture on customers and value earlier in the, the first part of the course, is that customer value is what drives your marketing communications. So what do I mean by that? Number one, it's not about your technology. In other words, you might have a great technology, you might have a great product, but uh, uh, what does that mean to be great? And that greatness comes from what value it gives to the customers. So it's not even about your solution, it is about how you solve your customer's problems. So every time you're thinking about marketing, you're thinking about that customer value and what their problems are, not what your problems are. <coughs> we have two types of marketing communications. We have inbound marketing and outbound marketing. Inbound marketing is any marketing tactic that relies on earning people's interest instead of buying it. Communication is interactive, two-way. <clears throat> Outbound marketing is more like the old marketing, where it's any uh, marketing that pushes products or services onto customers. That would be the classical commercials uh, and uh, uh, print advertisements, uh, advertisements in the uh, uh, roads or uh, outdoor advertising in the airports, the communication is one way. So more and more marketing is going into what's called inbound marketing, where you are engaging with customers, uh, particularly with social media, uh, to create that engagement and interactivity. So how do you execute the uh, marketing communication process? Uh, especially if you have a technology, demonstrate you have a strong underlying technology with promising advantages over the status quo. Very important to display thought leadership, uh, especially in technology where you're uh, seen as the leaders in this field, whether it be in content, in science, in uh, policy, and so forth. So sometimes people say uh, companies get involved in governments, uh, maybe to manipulate the regulatory process and, and uh, lobby for payments or lobby for favorable regulations. Uh, that may or may not be a, 
uh, a role, but one role in being engaged with leadership and governments is to display thought leadership, not just to tactically uh, sort of try to manipulate the process, which may be uh, you know, ethical or, or not. That's another issue we'll talk about. But also just simply to say we are responsible members of society, we're leaders in society, and so uh, that's part of thought leadership. Very important to frame a crisis in the mind of the customer. Uh, as we said earlier in the first part of the course, when you're selling something, the status quo, in other words, not doing anything, is a very powerful alternative. And so if there is no crisis, and I put that in quotes, then people may not actually buy. We have to create a real need or crisis. If you don't have this product, that could create a problem. If you don't have this product, you will miss something very important. So then you show how your product proves superior to existing technologies in resolving this crisis or this situation. So uh, driving a pioneering technology in the market, uh, if there's an early market, you want to reach uh, technology enthusiasts. Uh, so your evidence would be uh, around architecture, demonstrations, trials, technology press conference, endorsements from technical luminaries. The message would be to focus on the underlying technology, frame a crisis, as we mentioned, uh, aim for thought leadership. Uh, the media tools would be trade press, white, white papers, application notes and web, developer kits, speaking engagements, advisory councils. If you're in an early market and you want to reach the uh, visionaries, the product evidence will be a little different. Uh, the message would focus on superior product, frame issues that you can solve better than anyone else, anyone else establish the product validity, and a slightly different set of media tools. So this is market entry, particularly with a pioneering technology. So some four, uh, closing thoughts, the four P's of marketing. This is just a joke. Uh, so this is a soap salesman, the four P's of marketing, please, please, please. And she's not very happy, but he's trying his best to communicate how good the, the soap is to traveling salesman. So next time we're going to do uh, channels and partner ecosystems. So the four P's of marketing are product, price, promotion, and placement. We've talked about promotion roughly. Uh, we talked about price, and uh, now we're going to talk about the placement. What are the channels? How do we sell, and where do we sell the product? And very importantly, what partners do we work with? What partner ecosystems will help in creating the market for this product or service? So that's the end of this lecture. We'll uh, open for some uh, questions.